Hi guys and welcome to the economics of entertainment. In this video, we're going to discuss how the Saudis are taking over global sports. Unless you've been living under a rock, you'll know that in recent times, the Saudis have invested heavily in sports. But the question is, why? In this video, we'll discuss the motivations behind the Saudis' foray into global sports, who's going to benefit, and what the outlook is for sports like football, F1, boxing, and golf. Now, before we can discuss the future or present, let's go back. The Saudi journey is an interesting one. In 1938, an American-owned oil well in Saudi Arabia drilled into what would soon be identified as the largest source of petroleum in the world. This changed the course of history for the nation. The discovery of oil has resulted in the Saudis exporting millions of barrels per day in exchange for money, a lot of it. Now, with the vast amount of wealth that has been built by way of oil, the Saudis have reinvested in its people with free education, healthcare, and employment opportunities. All of this has occurred under the leadership of the House of Saud, the royal family which has controlled the state since its inception. Having this sort of leadership can be beneficial in the sense that it allows a nation to not only plan for the short and midterm, but also for the very long term. In most other circumstances, this type of leadership can only go so far, especially if the average citizen is starving, uneducated and unemployed. This recipe has not been the case for the Saudis, as their population has largely shared in the benefits of being one of the world's leading oil exporters. This brings us to where we are today. The Saudis have built an economy to date which is far too reliant on one resource. As such, it's imperative that Saudi Arabia diversify away from it. While it may be true that, at current rates of consumption, it will take approximately 221 years before reserves are depleted. Some estimates indicate that demand will begin to slow drastically in the late 2020s. In addition, and generally speaking, the world is also very much trying to move away from the consumption of this resource. And all of this poses a real threat to the Saudis. So moving away from oil and focusing on developing other parts of the economy makes sense. The diversification of the Saudi economy is important for a few reasons, but principally because it will allow the nation to compete with other nations in modern times. Generally speaking, Saudi Arabians have become accustomed to a good standard of living. And to maintain this in the mid to long term, the country has to be competitive with regards to quality of life, education and employment prospects. But how exactly will this be done? This is where sport and entertainment comes in. The Saudis have invested heavily in football, golf, F1 and wrestling via its sovereign wealth fund, the PIF or PIF. PIF has 700 billion of assets under management and also has interests in businesses across the globe, such as Activation Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Uber Technologies, and Lucid Corporation. Now, one of PIF's aims is to lure foreign money into the country by kickstarting new industries. By doing so, Saudi Arabia can generate income into the future. In addition, the nation may be looking to win influence abroad. In football, we've seen the Saudi Arabia Sovereign Wealth Fund, PIF, take majority ownership stakes in four Saudi Pro League teams, and then subsequently invest in signing some of the world's best players like Ronaldo, Benzema and Neymar. The salaries being offered to these players are life-changing, even for those who are already multi-millionaires. Because of this, other players have joined and will continue to join the Saudi Pro League. Even though this move by the Saudis to invest heavily in their domestic game of football has faced criticism for a number of reasons, it makes sense for others. Firstly, Saudis love football. So why not bring the best players to Saudi to play? Secondly, if you buy a European club, you have to follow regulations set by domestic leagues and you're constrained by things such as financial fair play. In essence, there are outside bodies which tell clubs and owners how they can spend their money on their club. Now in the Saudi Pro League, this is not the case. Clubs are free to spend what they want, providing ownership can support it. This frees Saudi owners from having to deal with the bureaucracy of people in Switzerland telling them how they should spend their money and then finding them if they fail to acquiesce. Lastly, it benefits a lot of football clubs globally because there's a new player in town willing to spend money on talent. Now, this in particular will allow the Saudis to grow their influence and perhaps flex it at some point in the future. 
Now, one of the principal risks is that athletes and entertainers view the Saudis as an easy, big paycheck. Failing to perform at the level that they're expected to, thus diminishing the value of the entertainment that they're supposed to provide. There's also a risk of players coming over and getting a lump sum of money than bailing on the Saudis after a short period of time. I'm sure there are payment structures in place and things documented in contracts that should prevent this, but we shall see what the future holds. But the Saudi investment in football did not stop there. As well as trying to build its domestic league to rival that of European competitors, the Saudis have also purchased a European football club, Newcastle United, spending $391 million for the club in 2021. Again, this move has come under scrutiny and described as an attempt to sports wash. From the business perspective, many professionals would describe purchasing a football club in Europe as a bad business move, especially if you actually want to make money. However, on the flip side, this deal can be viewed as a move by the state to win influence in foreign land, which may be difficult to quantify from the outside looking in. Moving on to the F1, the Saudis previously invested approximately $600 million in McLaren Racing. In addition, the Saudis pay a hosting fee of $55 million per annum to host the F1. The sport of golf has also seen investment from PIF via the notorious Live Golf. After the back and forth between the two entities, Live Golf and the PGA Tour, the two entities decided to merge as it became clear that the tour could not, in monetary terms, compete with PIF. In addition, the Live Golf offering was in its initial form more convenient and lucrative for participants. This posed a real threat to the PGA Tour, which after seeing the writing on the wall, decided to negotiate terms to merge with the Saudi outfits. We've also seen huge amounts of investment in WWE, which is said to receive around $50 million for each event. Heavyweight boxing has also been a beneficiary of funds from the Saudi state. And the fights which took place in December of 2023 is what some would describe as a modicum of what is to come. Now, all of these investments by some have been disregarded as pure sports washing due to the nation's human rights record. As shown by this image, Saudi Arabia ranks low as it pertains to political rights and civil liberties. Also, women are subject to disparate treatment to male counterparts. And the legal system may be rather confusing to the average Western observer. But on the other hand, Saudis have an incredibly low crime rate. They also have a very high standard of living or quality of life for the average citizen. And lastly, homelessness practically does not exist in the kingdom. But considering the negatives that were listed, and now that we have some more context, it's clear to see that the allegations of sports washing relates to the country's human rights record and treatment of women. And to be clear, sports washing is as follows. But the question is, is it necessarily a bad thing? Taking a step back for a second, for each sport that comes into contact with Saudi money, it may seem like a real blessing. Imagine being paid four times more for doing your job, but elsewhere. Wouldn't you be happy? Also, sports washing as a tactic has been employed by others. So why can't the Saudis also use it? I mean, what's the big deal? Did Russia hosting the 2018 World Cup really change your view of Vladimir Putin? Lastly, if the investment in sports makes the country money, then who are we to judge? In any case, I think the argument that the Saudis' investment in sport is purely to sports wash their reputation is one that is far too simplistic. We must remember that the Saudis have a real issue at hand. The decrease in demand of its main export means that the country has to replace this income with something else. Sport and entertainment can be seen as a way to bring eyeballs and people to Saudi. Not only to enjoy the entertainment on offer, but also to live and work in the region which in turn will contribute to the Saudi economy. The Saudis are also aware of their image on a global level, so it's doubtful that they think they can sports wash their reputations entirely. That said, these strategic investments can be looked at as a way of building influence with the right people in the right places. But why else would the Saudis invest in sports if it's not to simply make money or only to sports wash? Well, it's because it keeps the citizens of Saudi entertained. And if you're entertained by this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you. Saudi Arabia has a population of approximately 36 million people. 
51% of which are under 25. Around 24% of this demographic are unemployed. Now this could present an internal security threat if these people gather and begin to demand change. So one way to appease this group of people is to bring the best sports stars and entertainers to the country in exchange, of course, for cooperation. It's important to note this is not a tactic that has been outlined by the Saudis, more rather a suspicion of some journalists. But in any case, it seems to be working. And the demographic of unemployed youngsters previously mentioned seem to be, at least for now, content. So ultimately, who benefits from all of this Saudi investment? In the short term, the main beneficiaries will be athletes, entertainers and non-Saudi football teams. Athletes and entertainers will benefit because they're being paid way above market to do their jobs. The overall sporting ecosystem that has Saudi interest benefits because it raises the bar for remuneration for all of those involved. Other football teams who sell players to Saudi will benefit because they get to sell players at inflated prices and cash in on the gold rush. If you'd like to know more about football transfers, check my video out on it here. Longer term though, the principal beneficiaries will be Saudi Arabia and the Saudi people. Saudi Arabia will be home to some of the most spectacular sporting spectacles. And people, not only locally, but also from abroad, will flock to the region to see sports. Ties will be deep-rooted with fans, leagues, governing bodies and governments abroad, allowing the Saudis to further flex their influence with foreign nations. Now, if Saudi becomes an entertainment hub, it will attract tourist dollars, something its neighbour UAE has done extremely well in recent years. And the local economy will ultimately benefit from this. As investment in the region increases and opportunities to make money grow, skilled workers may want to move to the region for employment and or to start a business. So what is the outlook for Saudi investment in global sports? Saudi Vision 2030 is a government program that aims to achieve the goal of increased diversification economically, socially and culturally. The program will result in continued investment in sports, entertainment, infrastructure and education. So this means more investment bringing some of the best sporting talent to Saudi, cultivation of Saudi leagues and domestic sporting competition, and the creation of something sporting related that can be recognized on a global level. As foreign relations improve and influence is exerted globally, the willingness of foreigners to visit, live and work in Saudi may increase. But what do you guys think? Would you go to Saudi to start a business or to work? And if you're watching from Saudi, what are your thoughts on Vision 2030? Please let me know down in the comments below how this will impact you. As always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.